Hi, and congratulations. We've got a third of the way through a series of videos on my book, Philosophizer's Bible. And I want to thank all those who've stayed with me. I know the viewing figures are still rather small. I think YouTube doesn't like showing these in the search results. I don't know why. But I changed the titles to possibly um, get a better showing to Existential Philosophy, which I think is kind of descriptive, more descriptive, um, because it gives the ballpark area of where I am, what I'm doing. I am an existential philosopher um, of a certain kind, um, possibly a kind that hasn't been seen before. Um, in this video, I'm going to be talking about language. And this has been um, an interest, I would even call it an obsession of mine, over decades. And when I went first went to Oxford University to do my doctorate, it was going to be in the philosophy of language. And at the time, as I explained in the chapter, um, this was the big thing. Um, all, the st all the graduate students seemed to be doing philosophy of language. They were all reading the works of Donald Davidson and Willard Van Orman Quine and um, writing, you know, um, theses, their, their, their graduate theses, on aspects of the philosophy of language, which is what I intended to do. But then I realised that there was something wrong. There was a worm in the apple. They'd got it wrong. Um, all the problems, all the questions that they were addressing were not questions of language. And so I wrote originally my BPhil thesis, the metaphysics of meaning, um, basically arguing that language has got nothing to do with these fundamental problems, that it's just a mistake, an error. It's actually the possibly one of the shortest BPhil theses ever written. It was 11,000 words. The length was supposed to be 30,000. I sacked my supervisor, John McDowell, finished it without anybody's help because um, he basically said to me, look, you can't do this. And I said, well, I'm going to anyway. Uh, we did make up afterwards, and he was my supervisor for my DPhil. So for the DPhil, I had to expand a very, very short 11,000 word thesis to 70,000 words. And this was the result, the metaphysics of meaning. Um, obviously, it didn't have this picture. I'll show it, show it cl up close. What you can see there is an Apollo astronaut and a severed ear. And the quote is, we could build a world where there might be such objects as half a horse and a piece of river, my ear in the moon, and other similar products of a surrealist imagination. And that's the Polish Marxist philosopher Leszek Kolakowski. So I thought it was a suitable kind of a, <laughs> a little bit jokey, but illustration of the, um, the malleability of language. Um, and how difficult it is to pin down meanings. So that's really the point I'm going to be making in this chapter. Against all those who think that somehow appealing to language or to meaning shows why the kinds of questions I want to ask are impossible. You know, it shows why they can't be asked because you can't find the words to express them. And I say, well, of course I can find the words. I've just done so. You know, what is this book if it isn't words expressing these very problems? And they say, well, how can you possibly say that? You know, how can you put, you know, you can't even explain how these words have meaning. I say, I don't, don't need to explain how the words have meaning. I just know that they do. Just as I know that these very words that I'm saying to you now have meaning. Do you doubt that my words have meaning? Well, sometimes, you know, one does say stupid things or even meaningless things. You know, conversations can be sometimes pretty funny and meaningless. But on the whole, we know what we're talking about. We don't need to explain it. And in metaphysics, it's no different. You can know that you're talking about something. You don't need to prove it. You don't need to explain how the words are able to have the meaning that they have. So anyway, that's my hobby horse, if you like. Um, uh, but it's more like an irritation with 
the philosophers who would say that what I'm doing can't be done, that it's impossible. But it all started, as I said, back at Oxford um, when I realised that a lot of English-speaking philosophy was just on the wrong track. Unfortunately, I've been a pretty lone voice in making these claims, although um, today I would say philosophy of language has less importance than it had back then. Um, it's still the dominant, the dominant view is that somehow language has limits and that we know what these limits are and because we know what these limits are we know that metaphysics can't be done. You can't ask the kinds of questions that you want to ask. And I say you're wrong. Anyway, let's get down to the chapter. Words have no meaning. What is this? What are these words? What are they for? I said I was here to beat you up. In a friendly way, of course. I'm not actually going to hurt you. At least that's not my intention. It has been said that words are tools. I see words more as blunt instruments, like wooden clubs, or maybe not even as precise as clubs, because a club can be aimed. You swing your caveman club at another caveman, and you hit him right on the crown of the head, exactly where you intended to. Bonk. With words, on the other hand, the effect depends not only on your intention, but on the way your words are taken. A subtle insult can be received as a compliment, for example, or a compliment honestly and generously offered, taken as an insult. Bonk. The effect of words misunderstood can be cataclysmic. And of course I'm not saying that the person uttering the words understands them either. You know, a lot of the time we don't fully understand what we are saying. We don't know what our linguistic intentions are. I'm putting down words now, trying to express a meaning, trying to produce a particular effect in the mind of the reader or hearer. But I don't know myself exactly what meaning they have. Black squiggles form across the white expanse of a fresh page. What do they mean? How can they even have a meaning? They do and they don't. Words have meaning in the sense that you can use more words to explain what you meant. And if that fails, you use more words. And if that fails, well, at some point you just give up. There's no book of meanings that you can look up. A dictionary won't help. Philosophical debate splashes about in a sea of half-perceived meaning or unmeaning, a comedy of misunderstandings that after a while ceases to be funny. Meaning is not a value that a word has. That is because the properties of words are relative, not absolute. A relation changes whenever any of its terms change, and these terms, in their turn, are variable, not fixed. Despite all that, our language works. Words fulfil their purpose, at least most of the time, more or less. I know how to go on, is the way Wittgenstein breezily sums it all up in his discussion of following a rule in relation to language games. That's in the philosophical investigations. You just know. You have something you want to say, something half formed in your mind. Not even an image or an idea, just an implicit belief that something is there. And then you just go and say it. Or you write it down. You know how to go on. The words come. The black squiggles appear and you think, ah oh, yes, that's it. Or no, no, that's rubbish. In which case you try again, and you keep trying until you're satisfied. Contrast money. The value of a £10 note is exactly £10. $10 if you're in the USA. I mean, I'm not saying that the value of a £10 note is $10. You know what I mean. Even if inflation reduces the value of a pound year after year, the value of a £10 note will always be £10. If I hand you a £10 note, you should be so lucky. You know exactly how much money I've given you. 
That's how currency works. It should hardly be necessary to say that words are not a currency. Language does not work in the way that money works. Whatever method you use to give money to someone else, the financial input is the same. With words, on the other hand, you can never be sure exactly what you're giving. You write down some words and you're satisfied. You have succeeded in producing a pattern of black squiggles that pleases you, nothing more. And if others are pleased too, if they go on to produce words that match your words, that agree with them, then you feel that you have succeeded in what you set out to do. Early in the 20th century, the idea got hold that language is the key to the problems of philosophy. If you could analyse language, analyse its workings, then you could see how philosophical problems arise and also have a quick and reliable way of solving them. No more preposterous an idea has ever been conceived. It was actually the 18th century mathematician and amateur philosopher Leibniz who first floated this kind with his fanciful notion of a characteristica universalis, a calculus, a decision procedure that could be used to solve any philosophical problem. Um, in the text where Leibniz discusses this, he says that two men get sit down at a table and they say, gentlemen, let's calculate. And uh, you know, this is what philosophy was going to be. You know, polite calculation. <laughs> Anyway, four decades ago, when debates over theories of meaning were still at their height in English-speaking philosophy, I wrote my doctoral thesis, The Metaphysics of Meaning, arguing that the fundamental questions of metaphysics had nothing to do with language. Theories of meaning were irrelevant. All that mattered was the dialectic, as I termed it. The book is on Amazon, so you can read and judge for yourself. I didn't think then, as I think now, as wo of words as worse than blunt weapons. I was just using words for a purpose I seemed to understand. That was enough for me. Well, that was then and this is now. Human beings are fortunate. We invented this incredible tool called language and it really does work. How else did we get to the moon? How else was the mass of the Higgs boson calculated? Then there's the world of great literature, the whole of human culture, in fact. It is still true, from a disinterested standpoint, that what we term our wonderful culture is nothing but imitation, as I said before. However, as a human being, and not, say, an alien from Proxima Centauri, that's not something you or I are in a position to see. The worst sin of all committed by philosophers of language was the notion that the meanings of words being what they are, any discourse that is not about the world cannot be meaningful. This supposed insight took various forms, but the underlying idea was that words attached to bits of the words world, words attached to bits of the world or other words, either one to one or holistically, via rules that govern in a normative way whether a given word on a particular occasion is used correctly or incorrectly. These standards, these rules, cannot be detached from the world that we are attached to. We're stuck. We're completely stuck in our world. There's no getting away from the world, mundane reality, no way to express anything that is not in some way connected with the world, with what is or is not the case. Then what the hell have I been doing in these pages? What about for nothing or the cosmic stop sign? What bit of the world do they attach to? There is something beyond. Our mundane world has limits that are physical and also in a sense logical. Physically, none of us has any chance of living past the big crunch if and when it happens. When the big bang bangs again, the whiteboard will have been scrubbed clean not a trace of what existed before will remain. Logically, on the other hand, words set a limit to what can be thought or said that is permeable, not fixed. When you read a poem, for example, you see through the words to something that the words alone can never get a complete and adequate fix upon. 
I'm no poet. I don't have the required delicacy of touch. So I have to go a different route. My method is cruder, admittedly more confrontational. There is something out there that I'm getting you to see and feel for yourself. But I believe poetry alone, with its fine illusions, is not sufficient to express. That something is real. I know because I just know. But I'm not asking you to take my word for it, my meaningless words. You have to see for yourself. Um, there's not a lot more to say about that. I pretty much said everything I wanted to say um, in that chapter on the language question. It is a mystery how it is that we're able to mean what we mean. Uh, there was a question recently on Ask a Philosopher and someone said he puzzled over the fact that words came out of his, came into his head or out of his mouth or onto paper and he couldn't work out where they were coming from. You know, we're endlessly creative in coming up with things to say or write or think, as I'm doing now. I mean, I'm not, you know, I didn't plan the words that I'm speaking at this moment. They're just coming. And it's just a puzzle. Where are they coming from? How, how is it that they get to be sort of formed in some kind of meaningful pattern? And how do we know what they mean? And my answer to that is... There's not going to be a theory that explains it. You're not going to analyze it. It's just a fact that you have to accept. There isn't anything else that's going to explain language except language. And if you think you can explain it, then you're wrong. You have to trust that it works. You have to use words with sufficient confidence and most of the time you will achieve what you set out to achieve. Um, I don't think I have anything more to say about that. Till next time. <laughs>